So we're going to discuss resonance, which is covered in the organic reaction mechanisms chapter. The first thing we'll do is we'll look to define the term resonance, and resonance is the stabilization of neutral molecules or ions by delocalization of bonding or non-bonding electrons. And let's now have a look at a couple of examples. So in the first example, we're looking at resonance of the carboxylate ion. We're looking at delocalization of a lone pair of electrons on this oxygen here onto the oxygen atom at the top. And we can represent the delocalization of electrons using two double-headed curly arrows. These curly arrows shows the movement of an electron from this group, which we can describe as an electron donating group, so it's a plus M group, to this oxygen here, which we can describe as an electron withdrawing group, namely a minus M group. When we do that, we end up with this other resonance form of the carboxylate ion, and we can connect the two resonance forms using this straight double-headed arrow. In terms of orbitals, we can describe the orbital interaction using a picture like this. This is the p orbital, which contains the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen, and that interacts and overlaps with the pi orbital of the CO double bond. Rather than show the pi bond, what we've done here is represent the pi bond using atomic orbitals, the p orbitals on the carbon and the oxygen. And you can see that all three of these orbitals can line up and overlap to help to stabilize and delocalize the negative charge. For an ester, we have a similar situation. We can delocalize one of the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen atom in the ester onto the other oxygen atom, again using two fishhook curly arrows to show the movement of electrons from the electron donating oxygen, the plus M group, onto the electron withdrawing oxygen, the minus M group. Here's the alternative resonance form of the ester, and we can connect these two structures again using a straight double headed arrow. In terms of orbitals, we have a similar situation where we have a p orbital on this oxygen containing the lone pair of the um, electrons and show how that can interact with the pi bond, which again are represented as atomic orbitals. So we're now going to use resonance to explain reactivity. In this particular example, we're going to look at protonation of an enol ether. And here is the functional group called an enol ether. We have an oxygen substituent connected directly to a CC double bond. And maybe surprisingly, when you look at protonation of an enol ether, you'll find that protonation on the oxygen atom of the enol ether is less favorable than on carbon. Now let's look first of all at O protonation, protonation on oxygen. We can represent the protonation on oxygen is shown here with one double-headed curly arrow. We form a new OH bond and we put a positive charge on the oxygen. So this is the conjugate acid that's formed by protonation of the oxygen atom in the enol ether. When you look at the structure of the conjugate acid, you can see that that conjugate acid cannot be stabilized by resonance. So let's now look at protonation on carbon. We're going to look at taking pair of electrons from the pi bond and the CC double bond, pushing them towards the proton, putting the proton at the end of the chain and the positive charge in the middle of the chain. So here we have the conjugate acid now derived from C protonation. And this actually is more favorable than O protonation because this conjugate acid is stabilized by resonance. We can draw a resonance form derived from donation of this lone pair on oxygen towards the positive charge, which helps to spread and delocalize the positive charge over the molecule. We can draw two resonance forms for this conjugate acid, which is you can draw for a conjugate acid, the more stable it is. And typically the way protonation of an enol ether is drawn is shown here. We take the lone pair from oxygen directly through the carbon-carbon double bond onto the proton. And here is one of the resonance forms of the conjugate acid. Let's now look at explaining the reactivity of an enone, namely the position of attack of a nucleophile at an enone. As you might expect, a nucleophile will attack directly at the carbonyl group of an enone because the carbon atom attached to the oxygen is delta plus, it's electrophilic. 
So if the nucleophile attacks directly at the carbonyl bond, this is described as 1-2 addition. This carbon is the so-called 2 position. Perhaps surprisingly, nucleophiles can also attack at the 4 position of an enone, namely the carbon atom at the end of the chain. And this is described sometimes as conjugate addition, or if it's a carbon nucleophile, Michael addition. So let's now consider why a nucleophile attacks at the 1-4 position. Before we do that, we'll just look at the mechanism of addition of, at the nucleophile at the carbonyl. The nucleophile attacks the delta plus carbon, pushing electrons onto the oxygen atom, which is electronegative. We form a new bond between the nucleophile and the carbon, and we get a negative charge on the oxygen. Driving force for this process is we're getting the negative charge onto an electronegative oxygen atom, and this is 1-2 addition. So let's now consider 1-4 addition. And similarly, what you can see here is that we can take the electron density from the nucleophile through the carbon-carbon double bond onto the oxygen. And so we can get a product which has a negative charge also on the electronegative oxygen atom. And this is the 1-4 addition. You can also describe 1-2 and 1-4 addition by looking at resonance. Here's the enone, and we can consider alternative resonance forms of the enone. We can take the electron density from the pi bond and the CO double bond and push it towards the electronegative oxygen, and we get this resonance form here. And you'll notice in this resonance form, we have a positive charge on the carbon directly attached to the oxygen, and this helps to explain why a nucleophile can attack at this position in so-called 1-2 addition. Alternatively, we can draw a resonance form where we take electron density from the pi bond, donate it towards the positively charged carbon to give this alternative resonance structure. And in this resonance form, we have a positive charge at the end of the molecule. And again, you can see why the nucleophile would be attracted to that carbon because it's relatively electrophilic. So through resonance, we can help to explain why nucleophiles attack at the 1-2, but also the 1-4 position of an enone. Finally, we'll look at how resonance can explain 1H NMR chemical shifts in aromatic compounds, and we'll look at a couple of examples. The first example is methyl benzoate, and we're looking here at the chemical shifts of the hydrogen atoms on the benzene ring, and there are three different types of hydrogen atoms on the benzene ring of methyl benzoate. Interestingly, it's these two hydrogen atoms, which are shown in blue, which have the highest chemical shift, 8.1 ppm. So clearly, the ester is having an effect on these two hydrogen atoms, and we can explain the deshielding effect through inductive effects. We can take electron density through the sigma bonds and push it towards these electronegative oxygen atoms. But we can also consider resonance as well, and we can draw an alternative resonance form where we take electron density from the electron-rich benzene ring. We can delocalize and take electron density from the carbon atom at this position, or indeed at this position, which helps to de-shield the hydrogen atom shown in blue. So the electron withdrawing effect of the ester helps to de-shield the hydrogen atoms at the so-called ortho position. Let's now consider a different aromatic compound, this time anisole, where we have a OME group directly attached to the benzene ring. And now when we look at the chemical shifts of the hydrogens, you'll see something a little different. Namely that the hydrogen atoms shown in orange, which are closest to the OME group, have the lowest chemical shift, certainly lower than these two hydrogens here. Now we can't explain this by inductive effects because we would expect electron density to move towards the electronegative oxygen, which would in, in fact de-shield these two hydrogens, giving rise to a higher chemical shift. What we can do, however, is explain the chemical shifts through resonance. We can draw a resonance structure of anisole, whereby we take electron density from the oxygen atom and delocalize it and spread it over the benzene ring. And in this resonance form here, you can see that electron density is now moving onto this carbon atom, which contains this orange hydrogen. So it'll help to shield this orange hydrogen. And indeed, we can take the electron density and move it onto this carbon and shield this orange hydrogen atom as well. So in this particular case, the OME group donates electron density to those carbon atoms, which helps to shield the neighboring hydrogens. So you can see here, by drawing resonance, 
structures or resonance forms of aromatic compounds, you can use these to predict and understand 1-HNMR chemical shifts of substituted benzene rings.